Welcome to the anomaly, the contradistinct, uncensored, unmonetizable, and deemed unwatchable by the mainstream masses. We are the ones they cannot control and attempt to hold back, but together we form revolution. The Ramborgia. Welcome to John Rambo Presents the Show. Stay ballsy. Don't take any shit from anyone. So, for my job, I work in real estate, and uh, there's various tasks I must take on each day. So, this morning I had to go to this condo complex, I had to go into two of the units there and take pictures of the entire home. Like, just go through the whole house, take pictures of the whole thing, go outside, take pictures. And uh, these condo complexes have, like, these clubhouse areas. Okay. Yeah, so it's got, like, all your activities for the people who live in the uh, the area there. So I also had to go to the clubhouse. I was instructed to go to the clubhouse and take photos of all the stuff there. Because this, this goes online, and then people look at the home, they can see, like, what's going on there, right? What like, this place is beautiful, I must live there, and so on and so forth. Well, if it looks nice. It's okay. for the sake of doing virtual tours of properties. Basically, yeah. It's kind of cool for me, because I like to film and do things like that. So I was like, oh, cool, I'd go take pictures and... Like, all stylistic with it and everything, and way over the top, more than you, they would ever want you to do. And they, they usually delete all those, but anyway. I'm just, pic- I'm just picturing, like, you putting in the sounds of angels singing, like a <laughs> choir. And you're just showing, like, the front porch or the bathroom. Yeah, I do editing. I put, like, um, blood splatter all over the walls and, you know, things like that. The toilet, I have a head come out <laughs> of the drain. No, nothing like that. But So I'm going to, I go to this clubhouse area, and... It's got a basketball court. It's got tennis courts. It has wow. a pool. Uh-huh. So I go to the basketball court. There's kids playing basketball. How dare they? I guess school's out now. There's kids all over the place. It's like just taken over by kids. <sighs> so I start taking pictures of the basketball court. These kids are playing basketball, right? So they, they kind of start looking at me while I'm doing this. You're getting paranoid. So, yeah, so then I go over to the tennis court, and there's kids playing tennis. I start taking pictures of the kids playing tennis. Oh, tennis no. Court. And they're all, at this point, they're all kind of looking, and they're all kind of start some chatter going between themselves. And then I go over to the pool. There's kids in the pool. And there's like a group of them. I start taking pictures of the pool. And uh, they start uh, start uh, yelling things. <laughs> and uh, they're saying, uh, are you a rapist? And what? Then they start saying, there's a rapist over there, and pointing. You're, you're, you're a rapist. And I think they're doing this more to be, uh, they're, they're more to be, more to be pricks than actually in fear, I think. You know what I mean? How old are these kids? They were tweens. Maybe, uh, maybe 12, uh, younger. They were doing it more to, more just to bust my chops, I think, more than anything else. Right. But there's a whole, like, group of children all around you saying there's a rapist over there. And pointing at you. And pointing oh, at God. me. See, that's the times we live in. You know, it, well, you'd think, like, well, 10 years ago, maybe they'd think you were a scout. Maybe that's what you should be telling them. Yeah. No, I'm a scout for young athletes. <laughs> oh, well, then they all, you know, start showing off. They're too smart for that, kids these days. I don't know if smart's the right word. But I started thinking about it, like, I'm wearing, like, you know, I'm wearing a college shirt, I'm wearing a hat, uh, shorts, I'm like, maybe I look like, a, do I look like a rapist? This is what a rapist looks like. I start questioning myself. And, uh, but I have to try to calm things down. I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, there will be no rape today. Please. I'm just taking pictures. Could, I, I'm just here to go um, inside all your homes. Enjoy, yeah. I was just inside two homes taking photos. So I was just like, enjoy your activities. You will not be raped today. It's not, it's not going on. So I had, I had to get out. I just got a little out of control. But there's the story of today for That's, you both. Well, they did that at the, at the building I live, the Emerson. You can look it up, the Emerson in L.A., and you can see all of the amenities, all of the ground floor, the, the swimming pool, the jacuzzi, the gym. And, uh, and there was one shot of uh, someone being raped in the elevator, and uh, attendance uh, went up uh, you know, by, uh, by 30%. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Wow. Wow, California's a lot weirder than I thought. Different uh, laws out there. 
Oh no, no, there are no, no, the Wild the security West here is so high. There isn't. There, there's not a clam's chance on Mount Everest of someone getting in trouble. It seems. It would seem. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> How's the drought going? We got some more water coming in. Oh, like John, it is so bad. It is so bad. This is a six-year drought that we're in. It's been six years that we've been under the average rainfall, and there is breaking news going on right now that I just turned off about an 85-acre brush fire in Santa Clarita. So I immediately went to my atlas to look at where Santa Clarita is compared to downtown L.A. It's across the street. Well, there's nothing to burn down here. I'm not in any danger, okay. but uh, but it is a populated area. And between the drought and the fires mm. and the dry air, and we have water mains breaking, we've got fires busting out. Uh, you know, we need water bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, of course, the winds are picking up. But if they can contain the fire till this evening, it will improve things. It will cool off a little. The wind dies down. They make more progress against fires at night than they do during the day. Um, but uh, I've had it with fires. I don't need them. We have, you know, we yeah, we have four seasons. Mudslide, earthquake, fires. <laughs> What's the other? I can't have remember. Have you ever been close to a fire? Have you ever experienced this i haven't no because i the you I, run I, away the hollywood hills are probably the only um foliage close to any place i've lived in los angeles hmm. and they uh protect the hollywood hills because of the two griffith park golf courses it's where the rich up. people live so you gotta make yeah. sure they're safe <laughs> yeah a lot of rich people live up there live in the, in the hollywood hills it's not a big uh it, it's not a big agricultural thing. It's just, um, yeah, uh, anything that starts up there, there's somebody immediately putting it out. They don't mess around, huh? No. You got to take care of it. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, welcome to the show, my friends. My name is John. I am joined by the wonderful OJ. She wants to go with us. And the great Mr. Ed Trotta has joined as you could probably tell by now. Hello, Ramborsians. It's a great honor to have him, as always, and OJ mm-hmm. as well. Oh, well, thank you. Ed, big news for you, sir. Good news? Big news. You had a new video game come out a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah, Malfur- Heroes of the Storm? Malfurion Ro- Storm Rage Returns, voiced by Ed Schrada. Heroes of the Storm came out. Heroes of the Storm came out. About two okay. weeks ago. Yeah, well, I checked IMDb to see if they listed it yet, and they haven't. It, it is out. But it is out. Okay. Regardless well, of what IMDb says, <laughs> maybe, there's, there, maybe they're somehow against it or something. I'm not sure. Well, well that credit will, should go on my uh, IMDb list. I'm glad that that's come out. There's actually After. a bunch of videos on YouTube where you could check out all of your sayings in the game, all your vo- voice work. People have taken the character, and they just run through all the commands, and, and you hear you say things. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I checked that's it out earlier today. You didn't know about this? I didn't know about this, although I had a I had a clue because I got some tweets from people about uh, Heroes of the Storm coming out. And so I tweeted back saying, um, how's Malfurion Storm Rage doing? How is he to play? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and because I'm not going to, I'm not going to get involved with it. I, I just, you know, <laughs> I don't have the patience or the the dexterity uh, uh, to to stay with it, uh, you know. Ever since uh, looking for myself in t- as Tyrael, and so you tried the, you tried to play it at one point. I tried to play it. I, I did. Can't play do it. It. I played. By the time I found myself, by the time I found Tyrael in the storyline to Diablo, I was hooked on the game, and I played it all the way through. Oh, you did. And played it several times. Okay, well, uh, if you want to check out this game or any of your games, people put playthroughs up on YouTube. You can probably just f- watch it, you know, see what, okay. goes, see what goes down. Cool. Yeah, that might be a good idea, but uh, when did you record this stuff for this game? It just came out, I believe, June 2nd it came out, so when was the voice work done? A long time ago? Or? A long time ago. It's the huh. last time, yeah, I think it was done almost a year, like last August. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Huh. Well, I mean, these games usually, especially like titles from a company like Blizzard, they're going to take at least a year or two to get done. But dang. Yeah. They, they, well, that's what they do first is the voice work <laughs> before the artwork. They, they, in, in most cases, when an actor has to loop is what they call voiceovering, they have to match the, uh, the, uh, the image on the screen. But in, in this case, I record and then they draw around my articulation. Yeah. So that's why it, it's longer ago than would seem appropriate. Huh. Um, it sounds good. I like with the uh, little effect they put on your voice. I uh, I tried to mimic it a little bit on the video did, you did for us on the Eternal Con video. Yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, it sounds good, man. All the lines are quite quite interesting. But they did put a uh, they did put a, a, a um. What, what is, what Something's is it going on. I don't. I couldn't tell you. I don't know. They enhanced Some, the voice somehow. Yeah, a little bit. Just a little bit. It's, it's definitely I, you. Yeah, but there's a little twin. Good. You know, a little tweak. Uh So it sounds good, man. So that's that's awesome. Man. A new game come out. Good. Um, good. In, in other Ed Trout news. <laughs> okay, uh, Netflix. I've been browsing Netflix. They have uh, the full series of MacGyver on there. Is that right? They had every oh. episode of MacGyver. So I went back. I watched Jenny's Chance a couple of days ago. Oh, Jenny's Chance was my favorite. Yeah, yeah that's, I, that's the big I, one. And I did Blind Faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jenny's Chance was fun because I was MacGyver in disguise for most of the episode. Yeah. And I think I told you this story when my father saw it and I pulled the mask off at the end. My father said, you mean that wasn't you all along? <laughs> <laughs> it's the movie magic. You know, that that's like exactly what they want, though, right? Yeah. Just pulled into the story. You don't know what's real or what's not. And uh, that's the, the Hollywood magic right there. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So if you guys have Netflix, you want to see Ed, some episodes of MacGyver, you check out Jenny's Chance, check out Blind Faith, both on there. Awesome. Yeah. You don't get yeah, any, you don't get any kind of residuals from Netflix though, right? You don't know. Uh, do, do you know? Uh, not well. I don't know. You yeah, I do I do? I, oh. I, I think um, when when someone uh, views an episode, it uh, I get some kind of um, oh, it's a small residual. So I, I paid you something, a couple pennies. Yeah. For I watched a couple it. pennies. I mean, I've got residuals for four cents, three cents. What if I just leave it on? Just keep it on all day, just repeating the same episode. Oh, I don't know. Try to help you out. I, I encourage I'll everyone out there to do this. I'll have to watch and pay Ed too. No, I think I, I think it would only uh, you'd only get one viewing's worth, uh, regardless of how many times you let it rerun. All right, I see. Um, it's it's all right, John. You got this figured out. I appreciate the gesture, <laughs> but really. Once you've seen that episode, you don't really need to see it again. Well, I'll watch it again. <laughs> well, I'm watching it again. Don't worry. So, let's see. Um, the Earth has 7.125 billion people on its sweet lands. Four people have seen the show live in person. <laughs> if you would like to join this exclusive club, <laughs> Saturday, June 27th, Three days from now, wow, it's a quick turnaround. Three days from now, the New Jersey Comic Anime Con at the Morristown Hyatt, Morristown, New Jersey. We will be there doing a live show at 2.15 p.m. That's right. If you need more information, go to njcomicanimecon.com. It's a pretty, uh, pretty cool con, man. It's uh, the first year they're doing this. We've been talking to this oh. guy who's running it. It's the first year. Uh, these guys are putting this together, putting a lot of work in. These guys are awesome. Um, so come check it out. They're selling the tickets at the door. I believe it opens at 10 o'clock. So you show up, you don't have to do anything online or anything like that. Just come down and uh, say hi, man. Um, we'd love to see you. Along with us being there, Carl Custer, also known as Uncle Yo, also known as Jeff Reagan. Jeff Reagan. From Schnauzman Hole Punch, he'll be doing his show there as well at 11 a.m. the same day. So you come down, you check him out, uh, come see us. And maybe we'll be doing something together. Maybe. I don't know. We've got to talk to him, see if we can figure something out. Um, but I'm quite excited about this, John. What do you have to say? New Jersey Comic Anime Con. New Jersey Comic Anime Con. This Saturday at 2.15. Be there or be elsewhere, but we prefer you be there, so don't be not there. We'd love to see you. That's, that's We'd love to see you. That's, that's, that's basically what, what I was 
words. And we'll have a new Ed, Ed Shrada video will be played, will be shown at this convention that we put together, Ed. Will it be? It will, <laughs> yes, we made a video. Do you remember this? Uh, we made a video which we'll be showing at the convention. Um, uh, Ed got Ed got so into the character while we were filming it that he kicked his modem and knocked himself off of Skype oh. during, <laughs> during one of the takes. Which was awesome, but uh, so did one take. It was a one. It was one. a one. One and done. That's my training in television. You know, in television, it's a very economical uh, um, medium. And when you're doing like a soap opera, they 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 don't want to have to go back and do the scene again because you forgot your lines. Mm-hmm. Um, and and a, a show like General Hospital, it's an hour long. And you could have a lot of dialogue, and they expect you to know it all. Huh. Um, it's not like doing film where they where they have so many cuts and edits that they say, okay, we can we can work around that and blah blah blah. So TV's more of a more of a tighter schedule, maybe they got to get get in and out, get done, get the lunch out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, they have to do an hour episode in a day. Wow. Okay. I see. Yeah, that's a, mo- a movie how, is yeah. two hours long, and it takes months. Uh huh. Uh, I mean, budget. think about it. Well, John, think about it. We did Strasbourg and a whole punch. The first episode, which was like what twelve minutes in two days, they're doing an hour in one. Yeah, yeah. Plus, they got a lot more going on than we did. So, yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Very cool. Um, we did our first convention last week. We'll get to that in a, in a second here. I want to tell another story. I went to see Jurassic World on Sunday night. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but. I was going to the theater, I got to the movie theater, uh, and there's this girl standing there, Uh-oh. going up to people, and like, what's, what's going on here? So kind of observe from the shadows, which is what I do when I take pictures of children, but um, <laughs> observing what's going on here, this girl selling her CD, she, uh, she made a CD, a music CD, and mm-hmm. outside of the movie theater, just doing whatever she can, she looks like she burned maybe, um, you know a ton of these CDs and just going up to people trying to get five bucks for it or, mm-hmm. uh, or whatever, just tell people about what she's doing. Yeah. And, um, it was just such a cool thing to see. Cause you're like, you'll see this thing from time to time at like conventions or things like that. But like outside the movie theater, like just, you know, just, just on the grind and just, and just doing whatever she can to get somewhere, you know? So it was yeah. kind of a cool, like cool thing, motivating thing to see. Yeah. That's uh, busking in a way. That's uh, you know, guys go out with their guitar, stand on a corner with the guitar case open, and uh, hope someone throws uh, some money into it. Yeah. Um, uh, I I tried that once with my daughter. We sat in um, Riverside Park, and we just kind of found a little spot, uh, but it, it it didn't feel good. Uh, right. It was. Um. In a lot of most places, you need a license to busk. Yeah, you're not supposed to do it. I'm sure it's not oh. something that she wanted to be doing, right? Like, I don't think she's like, oh, I want to stand outside here and awkwardly yeah. ask people about the CD. But it's just, I want to get somewhere. I want this to happen for me, or, or I want to achieve something. I'll do whatever I got to do. You know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of thing that's kind of you take away from it. That's a, a cool thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, well. Huh. There's a story about, I think it's Howie Mandel, I'm not sure, um, but that uh, he got his start by hopping the fence at uh, Raleigh Studios <laughs> and and just finding an open office, finding an office that was unlocked and getting on the phone and promoting this new talent named Howie Mandel. Oh, wow. So we'd go in <laughs> and, and talk to and we'll call people? and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just kind of... Uh, and, and you know it's like, well, you, you know, you can't fault the guy. We do what we got to do. Yeah, uh, you, only, you only live one time, and you know, got to do what you got to do. Got to make I the most of your time. With people who lie on their resumes, I, yeah, that's, that's not good. That's not cool. I have a trouble with that uh, because uh, it, it's hard to to earn each of those credits, and if people mm. can, and if people just put them down, and people just lie about things they've been in shows and. Yeah, I mean, I, wow. I remember one interview with a, a, a potential agent who uh, saw a picture of me and a credit, uh, the credit for Equus. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, uh, who played the mother on the national tour? 
And I said, oh, I remember, yeah, Betty. Her name was Betty. Betty what? I said, I don't remember her last name. I just uh, just remember her as Betty. He said, well, you better find out her last name because that's how we check on theater credit sometimes is to ask the names of other people in that tour. And I said, why? What do you mean? He said, because some people will put a credit like that. And this is where I learned about people lying on their resumes. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it was pretty upsetting. I said, well, yeah. <laughs> I did that was I'm only claiming to have been a horse and the yeah. industry to Dalton. You know, if I were going to lie, I'd say I played Dr. Dysart. Um, <laughs> I ran the whole play. I, I did every, every part. Yeah. Well, well I, I, stayed with and... Equus, I stayed with Equus for two years and did get to play a horse, then Dalton, and then I did get to play Dr. Dysart on a guest artist contract at Durham Summer Theater. And it was one of the best uh, experiences on stage I'd ever had. You bring up a great point, though. There's probably so much dirty laundry and things that go on for people to get yeah. ahead, and especially in that business, right? It's probably... Oh yeah, oh yeah. Have you it's heard little... any? Have you heard anything really out there? Things people doing to get ahead, or uh, maybe you don't well... want to share. Well, a good case is uh, a good example, I guess, is is uh, OJ's um, well, uh, mm-hmm. OJ's uh, houseboy, Cato, uh, was a wannabe actor and got more film time by being on the stand, a witness. For oh, the OJ, uh, OJ Simpson. They're talking about our OJ. It's like, what? I'm like, wait a second, what did I do? It's like, OJ in court, uh, yeah, I believe it, but. Hey! No, not 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 you, OJ <laughs> Simpson. Yeah. His, okay. His trial. His his houseboy Cato was yeah. was a wannabe actor, and so he was just um, using that uh, that that crime, that that trial as yeah, it's parts. You know, and that that was sickening. That was okay. sickening, especially because the agency I was with at the time took him on as a client. Like, oh, this guy's out oh, right no. now. He yeah. He to live with O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Because oh. he had TVQ, TV quotient. He had been on, you know, he had been on TV for, you know, a, a certain length of time. People could associate his name with his face, and that made him, that gave him celebrity. That's what he so did not that. Act necessarily i don't know i never saw him try <laughs> but awesome. he'll be back he'll be in some superhero movie coming out soon we'll see yeah um, so yeah we did a convention uh, last week man um to mixed results i'd say we had three people in the audience but uh thanks to those who came out thanks for you guys that watched it via I saw four youtube people. I well, saw four. one of them was our friend kevin who we brought so i guess you could count him. we did watch it yeah <laughs> he came in the car with us so Sure, four people. Um, well, thanks for watching. If you guys watch it on YouTube, it's a bit of a mess. You know, thanks for uh, seeing through it. Hopefully it was all well, right. Yeah, that's where you'll get your exposure. Hey, yeah. some people, got, if you'll note, John, we got some pretty good comments on it. People were very nice about it. They liked it. But it was a little weird to prepare for. Uh, the communication was a little tough between uh, myself and uh, the convention. You know, understandable. They probably got a lot going on. They don't got time for a small change like me. But... Uh, Going in, I kind of structured it that there's going to be people there that may not know who we are, mm-hmm. but I did not really take into account that there may not be actual people there at all. <laughs> well, but I, uh, it was yeah. good to be prepared for the worst. Yeah, but I stand by it because I think you, going into these things, you got to think positively that people will come, you know, that people are going to be there. And exactly. I think, I think if you don't have that mindset, then you're kind of in trouble if people do show up and you're like, I got nothing. You know, so. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Right, right. So, OJ could talk about this a little bit. The convention itself, kind of interesting. It was in an aviation museum. So, you have all this stuff all around. There's uh, museum-ish aviation things. And then you have the Comic-Con with all the things the Comic-Con brings kind of mixed in. It was kind of really kind of strange. Yeah, not exactly a cross-referenced group of demographic uh, <laughs> aviation and people into alternative entertainment. Yeah. But, you know, you can't count. It's not a matter of how many people are in the audience. It's who they are. Mm, I like it. I like it. There could uh, be. I, I a, must. Yeah. 
There could be two people in the audience, and one Steven Spielberg, and the other is Daryl Zanuck Jr. Well, you can do the show, you know? Yeah, man, you got to do the best you can. Um, when we got there, I I do I kind of thought we were in trouble. We um, got to the building. We were like, all right, let's go to the room where we're going to be doing this, panel room number two. And, uh, boy, that was the, the appropriate name for that, number two, for this <laughs> place. So we we go to where it's supposed to be. We can't even figure out where it is. We uh, There's a yeah. science is panel two. And there's a door that says staff only that's wedged open that leads down a long hallway. Uh-huh. And a guy walked out. A guy walked in. They were like, is there a panel room down there? He's like, this is staff only and kept walking. Yeah, it was an employee from the museum who was there. And we're like, is, where's the panel room? He's like, there's no panel room here. And it was down, it was down this whole hallway. It's an employee's only. Well, so as was, panelists, didn't you consider yourself staff? I Maybe always consider must... myself staff wherever I go, but <laughs> wherever you go, the guy was basically saying you can't come down here. So we were like, I don't know where this is, man. Eventually, we just went down anyway, and uh, we kind of figured it out. And it was in this. Uh, you guys saw it was in this classroom, this weird classroom. So, it, and with these desks that I haven't sat in since like you know high school, basically. It looked like third grade. <laughs> it was like a, it was like a fifth grade classroom. <laughs> it was just so strange, <laughs> you know. Um, and then preparing for this, I couldn't really get the convention to tell me like what they had as far as um, pro- you have a projector, you have a screen. They kind of told me they did, but they weren't. Uh, they wouldn't tell me like how you hook up to it and stuff. And um, so we had uh, we had our presentation built on Howard's computer, and he couldn't. We couldn't use it because his computer has an HDMI cable and they didn't have the HDMI in the room. I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of wacky stuff that went down. Yep. Um, and uh, my idea for this was that because our panel was at three, so I'm like, all right, right before three o'clock, I'm gonna go around the convention and kind of corral people to come in and just kind of pull them in, right? Or tell them it's happening. When I went out there, there was like no one left because the convention closes at five on the Sunday. And this is about three o'clock. There was like no one there. I was just, I was walking around and just people, the dealers were there. And I was just, uh, man. So it is what it is. That reminds me of a show when I was launching my Lincoln one man play. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I did a a gypsy run at the Melrose Theater, on the Zephyr Theater on Melrose. A gypsy run is just one performance where you invite all your friends and you can get all their notes at the same time. Then the first sort of production of it was at the L.A. Rep Company on Hollywood Boulevard. And we had no publicity. We had no uh, advanced advertising. So we put a sandwich board down on the sidewalk. And I went down there as Lincoln ushering people in, urging people in. <laughs> yeah, whatever you had to do. Yep. And, you know, um, it was it was the workshop production. This is back in 2003. Um, and uh, it's improved since then. But, That's what it's all about. So I think we're kind of in the same boat. We try to, try to get better. Right. Um, so it's called paying your dues. Absolutely. Yeah. But, so we had, uh, we had the three people came, four people if you count Kevin. Um, out of the group that came, this is the, the good positive stuff about this. One gentleman, he's seen every show, he's seen every video we've ever done, and he bought the Blu-ray despite not owning a Blu-ray player. <laughs> so wow. that, that was awesome, right? Yeah, it was really cool. Awesome. Um, one of the, there was two guys that came. One of them, one of them never saw us before, but his friend had seen some of our stuff. And at the end of the panel, he said that uh, it was the smallest panel he'd ever been to but was the most entertaining he's ever seen wow so i was, wow. Like, I was like you couldn't say that on camera come on man <laughs> so, yeah, really. really so like by the end of it uh it felt good it felt good if, like everyone there enjoyed it and uh, i think we we enjoyed it as well oh yeah so and like ed said you know we uh i, I definitely got something out of it like I, I actually watched it um like two times back and i uh, got to go on notes and things to improve on and uh to build on and uh, mm-hmm. I'm kind of glad that it, it kind of came out how it did because it's like one of those stories you'll tell, you know, like like when you have a hundred people in the audience or something or like a thousand and then you say our first show had three, you know, like that kind of yeah. thing. Like, like I don't mind being at the bus, starting at the bottom and we're not like above anything or, or anyone. And uh, it's all about just learning and uh, moving on. So have you checked out the Morristown facility to see what the setup's going to be like? It's a hotel, so they're just going to have a, like a hotel conference room. Uh-huh. And they kind of told me they're going to have a, you know, they're going to have a projector. These guys are really good as far uh-huh. as uh, communicating, and they're, they're happy to have us. They're actually promoting it, and I uh, feel good about it. So, um, yeah. We, what we actually did is I made 
500 business cards. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. That says, uh, two, uh, 215 today, pa- you know, p- panel and all that stuff, like our logo and everything. Mm-hmm. So we're going to try to give those out as much as possible beforehand. Um, and uh, just put the work in, man, like the chick at the, the movie theater with the CDs, man. That's what it's all about. Just put the work in, maybe get something out of it. Right. And uh, there you go, man. I know Morristown because I played the, um, uh, what was it called? Milburn Playhouse. Okay. Uh, which is not far from there. And, uh, oh, had a little something going with a girl from Morristown. So Really? <laughs> who came to see, who came to see Godspell. Well, if you got her number still, please tell her to come. We need everyone we can get. The Mil- Milburn. Paper Mill. Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn. That's what it was. Uh, it's a big deal now. I mean, it, it's. It, I think it's still in operation. Yeah. Um, and Morristown wasn't far away, so she was a, uh, um, a regular to that theater. Jersey gal. Oh, and she started, uh, she, yeah, I think this is the gal who started the... Uh, the Ed Trotter Fan Club, off of a book called Rona, Rona Barrett's How to Start a Fan Club. Um, this is a girl you dated? Uh, no, this is someone oh, else. Someone else. Yeah, who... who, who uh, I was going to say, if someone you dated starts a fan club about you, then you're doing something right. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. What could I say? I don't know what to say. All right. Just tip your I, I, I never met this uh, this girl who was president of my fan club. Uh, she would just she just decided to um, follow Rona Barrett's instructions and had me write her a letter that she would copy and send to all the fans, and uh, and they would all write to me. So I get all this mail, and I just have to write one letter. But then I started getting requests for photographs and locks of hair and. Things like that, and it, it got a little, uh, it got costly and a little yeah. out of control, um, and I, I let it fade, uh, and I, I probably shouldn't have. I think I told you that story because then you resurrected. That's the right. Edge. I'm now the president of the new fan club. That's right. <laughs> and um, now there's something more than Godspell to tell. <laughs> so after this whole convention thing went down, you gave me a call and you gave me a little uh, pep talk about some things. You told me some stories, Ed, about. Some shows you did where not many people came and things like that. Maybe uh, if you don't mind sharing with the audience oh. here. Oh, well, that was, I mean, the, the definitive case was a, a, a company of, um, we were doing Romeo and Juliet, which is a big play to begin with. And the director also added this entire core, this, this chorus of dancing girls that, uh, because we set our Romeo and Juliet in the far future. Oh, um, after weapons were banned so that all of the fighting was done with broken bottles. Um, oh, wow. So we had to, what a way for the show to go. Yeah. Well, we had to make our, our bottles because they were, they couldn't be real glass. That would be really dangerous. So, you know, but there is a way of making sugar uh, glass bottles that, that have soft edges, even when they're broken. But it, Anyway, uh, there was this other, so we had like 30 people in this cast, including the, uh, the troupe of dancing girls that, um, would dance at the party between the cap, for the Capulets and Montagues. And, uh, and they were also dream figures around Juliet when she was going through her angst. And, um, and one night near the end of the run, this also wasn't publicized very much, and Shakespeare isn't all that popular in L.A. Uh, and one night, we were just waiting for someone to show up, and a couple from Oklahoma drove in, just a couple, a man and wife, who drove in from Oklahoma to see L.A., and they wanted to come to our show. And it cost, you know, with all those broken bottles and the candle lights and everything, it cost a little something to do that show but uh, I was president of the Company of Angels at that time, and I was playing Friar Lawrence, and I said, let's do the show for them. Uh, 
you don't know where this will lead and the show must go on. Was there some and, people saying, no, we, we can't do it. I don't want to do it. Was there- yeah, there were a lot of people saying, I don't want to do this show. The It's like two and a half, to, two and three quarter hours. Wow. Uh, and it's nice. a lot of work and I don't want to do it for two people. And I said, come on, think of these two people. <laughs> And, uh, Plus you're, uh, you're honing your skills, right? You're, uh, yeah. Yeah, you pro- yeah. Stage time, man. It's all about those flight hours, right? Yeah. So uh, we did it. And uh, and I was glad we did. Um, oh, I remember we had a power outage during it, too. Oh, what? no. Yeah, and we had to, uh, we had to use the candles um, and flashlights to, uh, to get through the show. It's one of those one of those shows, man. But uh, Romeo and Juliet's kind of a dark story anyway, and so it worked, even uh, with candle and flashlight. Um, that's probably how it was done. Well, it was done with candles, right? Originally, I would notice. That's the thing. That's the thing with theater. You know, you never know. When we were doing the Dracula thing yesterday, was it just yeah. yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah. I was having uh, I was having trouble with all the uh, the uh, you know because I had those fangs made in 1985. Wow! First, first played Dracula, and I've had some dental work done, and it's amazing that those fangs still they're caps, and it's amazing that they came even close to fitting. But the amount of poly grip I had to use was no. was sticking to my lips. I like to drive and, it crazy. I just uh, imagine you're doing this today. It's like <laughs> oh, okay. It was fun. It was fun. But I, call, I called you. We did it over Skype. I called you and, uh, like, we have to go right now. It's, it's all coming apart. Yeah. <laughs> I said, what was the story you told me about the band? They were in the, uh, what was it? They were in, like, a $1,000 car with uh, 30 grand oh. worth of equipment or something. What was that about? Yeah, no, that was just a picture I saw oh, that okay. someone sent me on uh, email. And it was a picture of a, of a, of a beat up old car loaded with musical uh-huh. equipment and they said here's here's the typical musician's experience is to is to load thirty five hundred dollars worth of equipment into the back of a three hundred dollar second car <laughs> to drive two hours to make fifty bucks that they have to split. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Why do they do it, Ed? What's it all about? What compels these people? Passion. Is that what it is? Love of what they do. They would do it for free. Uh, oh, we you know, know. We're one, doing guy even free. Res- one guy even responded to that email saying, you were actually able to make 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John, imagine we got paid 50 bucks to do one of these shows. That'd be like, it would feel like a million dollars, I think. I would, yeah, I would be ecstatic. I because know, it would really. be somebody actually paid us to um, entertain them. Hmm. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, think, uh, I think time is a payment, sense. man. Time, time is a payment. People use like give you their time with all the the million entertainment options like readily mm-hmm. available to your at your fingertips. You know, I mean, like, that's the thing. Time's the only the only resource you're never gonna get back. So it's, so. it's always more valuable than money. Like the four people at the at the panel, they could have sat in the hallway of the convention, watched any movie on their phone, probably, mm-hmm. <laughs> or yep. whatever. So I mean, yeah, I think time they, time is a big deal. They could have gone to get the Power Rangers autographs. All right, don't give them ideas now. They might they might not come now next time. Um, well, we'll just make sure the Power Rangers don't show up. <laughs> oh, so, was that? You know, I know one of the Power Rangers, or actually not one of the Power Rangers, one of their arc enemies, uh, Mister or Doctor J- Jed. Oh, Lord uh, Z- Lord Zed, I believe it was. Uh, Lord Zed, that's yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. yeah he wasn't his name there. Was, uh, Robert Axelrod. And, he was not uh, there. No. It's a friend of mine. He wasn't there. Okay. No, I would have. I would have. I would have attacked him. So I know Ed. <laughs> no, he wasn't there. Now. Um, so I went to see Jurassic World last weekend. This was the biggest opening in the history of movies. Huge. Here, yeah. Big time. Um, kind of doing some research about this kind of thing. Blockbuster movies, summer blockbuster movies, right? And. uh the first movie that's considered to be a summer blockbuster was Jaws, hmm. 1975. Uh-huh. It's huge. It's, um, if you adjust to inflation today, it would be among the uh, top grossing movies. So mm-hmm. it's up there, man. And then uh, I think from that moment, with these, these big blockbusters, they always try to, to really just corral as many people as they can into these films. Um, 
so there you go. So Jurassic World, no exception to this, man. Made a ton of money. Pretty much everybody saw this. Um, I don't want to, I don't know. I, I think you saw it, John. Did you see it as well? I saw it. Ed, did you see it? No, I haven't seen Jurassic. Uh, it's not Park. It's uh, Jurassic World. Did you see the original yeah. Jurassic Park? Good. Yeah. Did I see what? The original movie, Jurassic Park in uh, 1993. Yes. Oh, you did, yeah. Yes. Um, that was really like a, an amazing event. It was, and it's and yes. it's interesting that you that you mentioned Jaws. Yes. Uh, in the same uh, paragraph, because there are some people who consider Jaws the, the grandfather of the uh, blockbuster movie. Yeah. Uh, and and some people have trouble with it with with blockbusters, right. with the um, the budgets and the cost. It's mostly and, the marketing is really what it's about. It's the the marketing blitz. Yeah, and the idea to try to get as many people as possible to see the movie. Um, but you look back and, at Jaws. I mean, Jaws is an all-time classic, great, you know, all-time film. So you can't. I don't know. A lot of yeah. them, some, some of them are too across the board. What were you saying, John? Um, I was just saying that it's it's kind of sad too because like a movie could do really well and make tons of money o- over the course of its run, but if it doesn't make a ton, if it's not in first place on its opening weekend, it's a failure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what kinds of stuff that comes out of that? Uh, well, that's why the advertisement, the hype is so important. Mm-hmm. And as much money goes into the uh, promotion of a movie as in the production of a movie. Yeah. It may cost $100 million to make, and it will also cost $100 million in TV time, in, in uh, advertisement, sponsoring. And, and like John said, if it doesn't make back three times that entire cost, then, yeah, then it's a failure or whatever, right? Um, but... Interesting that in 1975 you have Jaws, and then and then since that time, they have to try to keep getting the public's imagination, try to get them into the theater to see these movies. And this Jurassic World film is pretty much about that idea, right? So it kind of starts off with a shark, like Jaws, that they feed to a dinosaur, just discard the shark. Because at one point in 1975, the shark... That was that was enough, right? A shark. Wow, this is a movie about a shark. This is amazing. Yeah. Now that's not it's nothing, right? Now it's nothing. So they, not they compared they, to a dinosaur. And they're yeah, they're even they're even kind of conscious of this, and they're they're kind of telling you this, right? So the shark is nothing. They feed it to the dinosaur, but then but then the people watching this don't even care about the dinosaur in the movie because they're because dinosaurs are not commonplace, right? Yep. So it's essentially about the movies themselves. So then the movie. What happens is they, they have to make a genetically modified dinosaur to try to capture the public's imagination once again. A bigger, better, scarier thing. Um, of course, it gets out of control and, uh, you know, destroys the park and all that. And, and was it a, a, a non-existent? Was this a, a creature that never really existed? Yeah, it never really existed. They used DNA and they ex- experimented and they combined all these different dinosaurs into one huge monster. So... Yeah. I just thought that was really uh, kind of cool, man, uh, kind of like tongue-in-cheek kind of thing. Like, it's about you watching this. Like, you always want the next thing, the next bigger, better, scarier thing. And, uh, you know, what do you have to say about this, John? Do you have a, anything well, to add? I just wish they hadn't made science bad. Has science gone too far? We're getting too crazy with science. Like, you could interpret the movie as a big whole oh man science is going too far we're in trouble we better hold back them crazy scientists before they breed genetic super soldier dinosaurs to kill us all i think you could but i don't i don't think that's what they were going for i think it was more about you know be careful what you like wish for or something right like um as that as the movie well as the movie goer you always want better bigger da 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 but the classic thing maybe is, is fine which is essentially what happens in the end, you know. Yeah. Well, it's like, well, where are they going to go? Like, where do you go after everyone's bored with everything? I mean, we have these, using, I think, the correct term, the correct usage of the word, epic space battles and movies, like, what, what, like, we can show anything at this point. Yeah, you can do anything. So everything's well, amazing, so mean, nothing's amazing. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better... Than something that's small, more small, right? So this is kind of what, kind of what's about. Well, that's George Lucas's kind of um, 
uh, log line for what's his company? Imagination? Um, uh, Lucasfilm, um, Industrial Light and Magic. Industrial Light and Magic. If you can imagine it, we can create it. If you can pay us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can afford us, we will bring your imagination to life. But that was another that, – that quote also uh, was used on the uh, – when I went to um, Disneyland uh, on the train on the way out, they were showing us uh, all the events that were, be, uh, that were under construction. And the guy uh, commenting on the railroad said, as long as, as there is imagination left in the world, we will not be done. And our work will not be done, whatever. And, and I took it the wrong way. I, I thought until, until you're all zombies <laughs> without an imagination, we're not through with you. <laughs> no. But well, no, what yeah. they meant, of course, was that as long as there's something else you can imagine, something else you want will continue to improve. Uh, it just struck me that that time that way that that was my experience at Disneyland was that I felt like I was just like getting on lines and going through rides and uh, all over the lines and the lines, you know, for pirates of the Caribbean or the haunted mansion, you know, and, uh, and they would try to satisfy my imagination. Um, Did it work? And, well, it depends on your imagination, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, well, you have plenty of time to imagine stuff while you're waiting. That's true. So <laughs> how could anything be anti- anything but anticlimactic? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not, I don't mean to. I'm not bashing Disneyland. Oh, no. Disney's, Disney's awesome. We'll come after you. We'll do that. Disney's uh, great. Well, yeah, man, Jurassic World, like, it, it kind of brought me back uh, to... You're watching summer movies, man, as, as a kid, and had that definitely had that fun feel to it. You know, um, there's some crazy stuff in it, stuff you could kind of like logically, you're like, huh, but the whole thing is logically impossible in the first place. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't make sense to really like nitpick things. And Yeah, you uh, can nitpick all you want, you but, could. but the, they, you know, the they, whole it's, thing is impossible. It's utterly, it's utterly ridiculous. And I think, and you can kind of feel like deep down, they kind of know it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think so. I just love in the park where all the product placement, like you see a Starbucks in the background and all sorts of things. Yeah. I don't think it touches the original. That was a revolutionary thing. But it's good. I mean, it was, it's definitely like a real sequel to that in a lot of ways. More, yeah. more so than the other ones. Uh, what was the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? Uh, mental uh, or... Total Recall. Yeah, Total yeah, recall. yeah. Uh, I think they were going through town, and the only restaurant that existed was Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> of course, well, it's the best one. It's, it's an apocalyptic future, so <laughs> naturally, right. that's all that remains because yeah. it, su- it survives radiation. Yeah. <laughs> so here's some news today broke. We have a new Spider-Man. We were wondering who the new Spider-Man would be. It's me. It's not OJ. OJ, <laughs> OJ tried out. What happened? Didn't go so well. Sorry. They were upset that I brought actual spiders and threw them at the producer. <laughs> I'm a spider man, see? I'm covered spiders. I eat spiders. Um, um, see the other actors do that. I ate the spider off the producer. That just made it worse. Let's see the other actors eat spiders. I'm a spider. So well, the new Spider Man. Is he ever going to age? I the, think so. Well, they're starting him off young here. His name's Tom Holland. He's in high school. He's again. 19 years old. And it was between him and the end. It was between him. And an actor named Asa Butterfield. And the article I read, they thought that this guy, Tom Holland, won over Asa because they both had to screen test with Robert Downey Jr., who is about 5'8". And Butterfield is six foot. Tom Holland is 5'7". And perhaps that's why Tom Holland got the role, because he's not taller than Robert Downey Jr., well, honestly, you want Iron Man to be taller than Spider Man. Well, suppose he's supposed to be like a kid. Yeah. So that's uh, that's what the uh, that's the speculation. This article I read. I don't know if that's uh, even accurate at all. I thought that was kind of funny though. Um, Tom Holland, you say? Tom Holland. Name? He's been in the movie The Impossible. 
which I've never seen. He's going to be in Ron Howard's movie, The Heart of the Sea, which is coming out. That's all, uh, that's all we really know. Um, I'm glad he has some other credits, you know. And he, uh, 19, man, pretty much set for life now. He's going to have at least a couple Spider-Man movies, <laughs> at least a couple hundred million dollars for himself. Hey, uh, Garf- Andrew Garfield got a couple Spider-Man movies. God bless him. You know, I, I thought make he all was the money a pretty good Peter Parker. Yeah, some people are, some people are uh, upset. Like, why is there a new Spider-Man? What we had other Spider-Mans and stuff like that. You know, uh, I don't people really understand. Like, it's a they're bringing Spider-Man into, into the this Avengers universe, which already exists. So you kind of have to start him off new to avoid the confusion with what, what about that other guy he was doing this before and it's a little bit of a messy situation now see what happens this is the third reboot of (laughs) spider-man well they should make any superhero auditioning watch birdman oh yeah michael keaton in birdman to see what this (laughs) could do for or to (laughs) yeah like i haven't seen it yet i want to see that like 30 years like don't don't do this don't be like this guy Yeah. yeah but michael keaton in real life he's okay right who? Michael Keaton? Yeah, in real life he's fine. So I mean, Oh, I think he's... I, I like him. I like him a lot. Yeah. Uh, the movies are, you know, what could it be? If things go if things go a little wrong. I told you he was their original choice for Liar Liar instead of Jim Carrey. Yeah. Uh, wow. The writers, the writers had Michael Keaton in mind. And if, you, and if you think of that movie and replace Jim Carrey with Michael Keaton, uh, I think it becomes a better movie, frankly. Wow. Uh, not, nothing against Jim oh, Carrey. Jim Carrey's never coming on this program. That's Remus. Oh. Well, at the time, the time Jim Carrey's going to get you more box office, right? At that, at that point. Well, you know, he, no one could have done the mask, but. but yeah. Jim, he, oh, yeah. He was perfect for that role. That role was, like, made for him. Yeah. I was a fan. What? I was a fan of that. <laughs> Let's not talk Ace Ventura, shall we? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have a little article here. I'm going to get your guys' take on this. Uh oh. It says, uh, let's see. Uh, man accidentally records doctors mocking him during colonoscopy. <laughs> oh, no. A Virginia man known as DB went in for a routine colonoscopy. Uh, in 2013, ended up learning the hard way what doctors talk about during medical procedures. Using, this rings a bell. I think I heard this story. Yeah. Using his cell phone to record the discharge instructions, the patient forgot to stop recording, ended up accidentally taping every word said in his procedure room. Uh-huh. After five minutes of talking to you in pre-op, the anesthesiologist told the sedated patient while he was under, I wanted to punch you in the face and man you up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> What? A medical assistant was later instructed to lie to the patient and put a false diagnosis on his medical chart. The assistant noted their patient had a rash, and the brash anesthesiologist warned her not to touch it. Quote, you might get syphilis or your, on your arm or something. The doctor, who also called the patient a retard, said it's probably tuberculosis in the penis. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't even get that one. Um, and... The practice was sued for defamation and medical malpractice. Uh, let's see. It's a three-day trial. The patient was ordered. Oh, the uh, the doctor was ordered to pay him five hundred thousand dollars. Wow! Wow! So there you go. Serious business, huh? I always wondered about these things because I mean, you've uh, you know, John, you, we've we've all worked at different places, and you kind of see how the sausage is made behind the scenes, you know. Like I've worked in different not, stores and things like that. Not with tuberculosis. And a lot of times it's chaotic, you know, and uh, and there's stuff going on in the back, people talking about crazy things, or, well, or you uh, talk to a customer, and then you go in the back, and people start, you know, going nuts. Yeah, about, but you don't do it over their unconscious body while no, you're no. jamming something up their butt. No, but it just, it just makes me wonder, because like, like I said, I've worked places, you see what people are. There's like the reality, and there's like the presentation that you put forth to the customer. Essentially, yeah. what a patient is is a customer in a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah, doctors are, should be held to a different standard. I'm not saying it's okay, John, artists. please. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just saying, like... I, honestly, everyone, like restaurants, you shouldn't put things in the food. I mean, it goes for all well, jobs. First, do no harm. Okay, you're saying harmful things over a person's body. 
that's breaking the Hippocratic Oath in my mind. You're going to make that man depressed. I'm going to agree with you here. I'm not, it's not a good thing. Oh, yeah. I, I know you agree. I just It just makes me very angry. Yeah, that's, that's wild, man. I think we should just record ourselves all the time. And then you could make, imagine the podcast this guy could have made with this recording. Put that well, on that's, iTunes. Huge. That's why he got paid $500,000 to uh, keep it quiet. <laughs> that was the most lucrative podcast recording in history. These doctors. Wow. Five, half a million dollars. If I get half a million dollars, you would knock me unconscious and say whatever you want about me. That's perfectly fine. I don't, well, I don't today even... I heard that a, a, at Christie's, the um, art uh, gallery that sells uh, masterpieces, that a Monet went for something like $120 million. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was coming close to like their all-time high of uh, $180 million for a Picasso. And it made me wonder about why the price of art. Are these people collecting because they think it's going to amortize, it's going to increase in value? Are they investors that way? Are they people who don't want anyone to be able to see that except themselves? That's kind of selfish. It yeah. happens. Uh, or, or do they really think that gazing upon that Monet is worth $180 million? I, I don't know. It's probably like... Uh there's, yeah, it's probably the people who are collectors that just want it. I, in my collection, I have the X, Y, and Z, and look how much it's worth. I could see somebody wanting to, like, if just picture pick, just picture the art itself, like, putting that in your house, being able to look at it and think, Monet spent hours upon hours upon hours making this. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, I could see that art being worth a lot of money. Like, there might be some people who are legitimately just in awe of it. That'd be great. But, That'd be the best circumstance. Usually it's, uh, I, yeah, mean, I want to sell it or I want to, like, just have it. <laughs> right. Now, this is my Monet. And this is my other Monet. And yeah. this is my other, other Monet. Mm. Yeah, it's, which is, like, the very opposite of what art should be, right? It's, um... It's, sure. It's becoming, it, like, a, it's like a car or something. It's become, like, a, a little thing, a little trinket that I have. Look at me, how great I am. Well, well, considering, though... It was though, supposed to be a piece of art that makes people feel things and wasn't made for that much money. The guy didn't, who made it didn't get that much. Or it was, that wasn't really his intention. It was to make something amazing. I mean, it's, it's you've got art like that, then you've got art where it's a portrait that you've been paid to paint for, like, some rich family or something. Like, I don't know if the Mona Lisa was like that, but if you go to any big art gallery, they'll be like, Oh, a painting of Count de Moneybags. And it's just this dude with, like, a mustache and poofy wig standing there with the cane inside his house getting painted by some dude. Yeah, that's why there's a lot of religious paintings because the church would finance mm-hmm. the stuff and, okay, I'll make some money, I'll do this for you, you know. But unfortunately, most artists don't uh, pre- don't get to enjoy their own success because they become more successful after their demise, after their death. Yeah, because the- there won't be any more paintings from them. They're worth more. They're all worth more. Like, it's the opposite of a car. Car drives off the lot, it's worth less. Person, artist drives off the earth, it's worth more. There we go. Okay. Yeah, well, well you know, especially the, the older guys, they didn't find the stuff till later, you know. It was, you know, different I met a famous artist once. I met Salvador Dali. Wow. Wow. In a uh, movie theater uh, when I went to see Young Dr. Frankenstein in New York. Oh. And uh, he had come in, like, uh, at the end of the previous movie, the one that we watched, he didn't want to wait online and be, you know, crowded by people. So he comes in at the end of the movie, just doesn't watch the end, and sits there quietly. But a friend of mine that I went with said, hey, isn't that... I said, I, and it's hard not to know Salvador Dali with that mustache and the big <laughs> cane, and, you know. And uh, I, I, I had to shake his hand. I went down to I went down the row, and I said, excuse me, but... And he said, yes, I am. <laughs> Before I said anything, you know, are you, you know, like, are you Salvador? I didn't even get that out. I just said, excuse me, but yes, I am. And I said, well, I would just like to shake your hand because uh, I have, uh, I've brought a, a poster of yours with me on the road to homify the hotels that I occupy. And he said, that's very nice. And he gave me his hand and it was like a huge fish. It was so soft. And and speckled, and uh, I realize it never did anything harder than paint with a brush, you know, um, that hand. 
But there's a story about him being asked to do, but he did enjoy success as an artist before his death. And someone commissioned him to do a, a painting that they were going to hang over the couch. And then they had the audacity to tell him what colors it should be because they wanted it to match the couch. You, you know what? You get a whole new living room if Salvador Dali is painting you a painting, okay? Yeah, yeah. If Salvador Dali does the painting, then you design around it. You don't yeah. tell colors. So what he did was that he went out on his yacht. He got a couple of sea anemones. And he dipped each in the colors the guy requested. And he just held the canvas over th- these these uh, sea creatures and let them paint it. <laughs> you know, figuring, okay, mister, you got your colors. That's the thing. Once you're, once, you're the fam- once you're in the door, you can just do anything, right? <laughs> and it's, it's gold. Yeah. You're just printing money at that point. Johnny, what's going on with you, sir? What else is happening? Oh, gosh. Uh you okay Not today? A little, little horse there. Were you screaming at someone or? No, what no, happened? no. No, I'm, uh. I, I hear a little, little hoarseness. I don't know. Under I've the been. the weather a little bit or? No, I don't know. Maybe it's, I, I've been exercising. Maybe I'm just tired now. I don't, I don't what know. What type of exercise is just going on here? Well, okay. So you've asked and I didn't even bring this up, but so. You kind of did yeah. bring it up, but. I did. Get... Well, you asked what was going on. And you brought it up. Regardless, there is this silly jogging application called Zombies Run, where you basically jog through an audiobook. And huh. occasionally like basically it's in the uh, post zombie apocalypse, it starts and there's a there's a set of missions. Each one is for a particular is each one is, you know, about the length of a run. And what ends up happening is you start off and there's people talking to you. You're in a helicopter, you're gonna get dropped off at this township, and you're gonna go help them out and bring them supplies and stuff. Your helicopter, then they're like, oh no, there's someone with a rocket launcher. Your helicopter goes down. You have to run through the forest, dodging zombies, run through a, hel- through a hospital and go to the place. And basically all you do is run. Every now and then zombies chase you and you have to run faster or zombies catch up to you and you have to distract them by throwing away precious supplies and whatnot. It's pretty fun though. So hold on a second. This is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm lost. Okay. So you like exercise too? Would it tell you like it says run, or you're supposed to run? Then you have run in real life, in real time. Is that what you're saying? You, you can do it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. basically, you'll be going, and it's like, I'm Sam Yao. Um, I'm going to be your uh, radio operator for the day. I'm uh, not really good at this, but you've got a big pack of zombies approaching you from the south. So head north to the water tower, and uh, if you hear a beeping noise, that means they're gaining on you. So go faster, and whatever. Run! Is this hard to and, do? Like running through uh, an urban area, we have to stop for cars and stuff. Well, the thing is, or you just go full steam ahead into the street. The zombies are coming. I have to run. Well, you can turn off the zombie chases, and if you do that, then you can just go at your own pace. Okay. And then there'll be story bits where they tell you a little bit of what's happening. Like, uh oh, this person's hacking and coughing while they're on a run with you. Are they going to turn into a zombie and bite you before you come home? And then it plays your music for a few minutes, and then it plays another story piece. And while you're jogging, every now and then, a, a voice says, collected a tin of food, collected pain meds. And when you get back, there is an application on your phone where you can use the supplies you found during your run to build up the town. How is this done? Uh, basically, while you're jogging, it randomly says, oh, you picked something up and I you're trying to, to do it. It gives you, you one like, supply. Does it want you to like bend over, pretend you're picking up something? No. You don't do anything but run, and if you and, and there, sometimes run faster. Are there points where it's like kill the zombie and you pull, you brandish a knife and start throwing it no. around, throw no, the knife? There's there's none of that. Jump off, jump out the window. <laughs> no, no, it just says run. And the funny thing is, if you turn off zombie chases, you don't have to. Well, how's it working out? Like, uh, do you find yourself more interested in working out now because of this? A little bit, yeah. It's kind of sad. Ed, how do you feel about this whole thing? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a whole new world out there, Ed. It's not a, it's not a good one, but it's, it's a new one. It's a new one. Uh, run, chase, defend, shoot, you know, the, the options, uh, don't seem to be, um, really, uh, that original. Um, well, it's the, it's the motivate you through your, your, get you through your workout, which can be boring. I I would think it drives me insane. I am so bored. As long as it's working for somebody is good. So I mean, you I don't like ever to, hurt anyone. Oh, sorry. Go on. 
I like the old Atari, uh, Atari, now you know it's old if it's Atari, the old Atari thing that you hook to your TV with a joystick, and it was called uh, Space Cadet, and it actually had an ending. If you actually defended these uh, space stations from invasion from these uh, um, extraterrestrials, the game would end, and some music would play, and it's over. And I've never seen a game like that. There, there are always levels to go to higher, and um, the object was to see how long it would take before you died. No. Um, well, eventually, you, you know, it, you, you, you get to a skill level that's beyond you, and you die. Uh, huh. uh, I like this one because it had a uh, had conclusion, had closure. Yeah, it's funny because even like some modern, some modern like games that have like a coherent storyline where you know, okay, you get through the end. There's the end of the story. Now it's play through again on hard mode and right. play through the same story again. Like, okay. Sometimes speaking of games, you're making me think of something here. Like I was talking about, sometimes these simple games are, are really a lot of fun, man. Um, there's a game that my little cousin who's about uh, I think he's ten years old turned me on to. It's uh, a game you play on your browser. And uh, it's uh, A-G-A-R dot I-O. I was thinking the same Have thing. Have you played this game? Yeah, Agar dot I-O. I love it. This is, a, this is a thing? Like, people are in, like know about this? Yeah, it's just great. So, uh, here, explain this game to Ed. Maybe you'd be interested in this. I think you, can, I think you should play this, maybe. Tell him about okay, it. Okay, so... All you need is your all, mouse. All you need is your mouse, and then it helps if you hit the keyboard, though. Um, basically, you play as a cell. You really a circle. You're a circle on a, on a little grid, and there's smaller circles. Basically, you run into a small circle, you eat it. If it's smaller than you, if it's bigger than you, it eats you. And all the other – there's little food circles that anyone can eat, and then there's other people, and they, the, the cell just moves – the circle just moves toward the mouse. And uh, the smaller you are, the faster you are, the bigger you are, the slower you are. But if someone's chasing you, you just need to run into, you just need to run into someone slower than you, and you eat them and instantly become bigger. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of these games I think like anyone could play, right? You could, I mean, mm-hmm. like within five minutes you could be playing it, and it's just a lot of fun and simple. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's, it's very like, simple. It's like a perfect game. It's like, wow, this is really great. And it's like and I mean, addicting quality to it. And, yeah, just watch out. Some people name their things after not cool things. I uh, I was messing with different names, and I had experimented. Like I would play with just a normal name, John, and people wouldn't really attack me too much, right? Yeah, and I tried some other names just to experiment, Uh-oh. and one of the names I used was Jurassic World, but, I, <laughs> uh, but I, everything was in lowercase. But the uh, ass in Jurassic was was uh, capitalized. <laughs> of course, it was. So people were like attacking me like crazy when I had that name for so it was, it was just weird, you know. It was an experiment I was doing. I'm still working on that. <laughs> oh, that's just this is a cool game. Uh, Ed, what's happening over there? What's going on? Uh, well, uh, ooh, outside of fires and, um, um, uh, and drought, uh, Jeez. In, in the world of LA. Locusts too? What's going on here? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm back to that. Uh, <laughs> what else is going on? Uh, I don't know. I'm still, I'm, I'm still adjusting to, uh, you know, where I live now. Yeah. How's that uh, go? It's been a couple months now. It was Sunday, I had my daughter over for Father's Day, and that was glorious. Yeah, I wanted to say Happy Father's Day to you. I forgot about this. Yeah, Ed, Happy Father's and, Day late. Yeah, she came over and uh, really made my day. She said, Dad, we're going down to the pool, and you're not going to just dip in it. You're going to swim. You know? <laughs> and uh, she's got me on this exercise thing. Now I'm swimming every day. Nice. And... Uh, and she said, next time I visit, we're going to go to the gym. Um, and uh, John's going to hook you up with the zombie swimming program. Or maybe it's like a Loch Ness Monster is chasing no. you in the water. And no, you have to swim away. No, I, well, I was, uh, I was reluctant to go in the pool uh, alone uh, because I hadn't been swimming since like 2011. Uh-huh. Uh, because uh, I have this um, sort of neurological condition that every once in a while surfaces, throws off my balance, my equilibrium, and I forget which way is up or down. And 
the last time I went swimming, I had to be pulled out of out of a pool at three oh, feet. Gosh. At three feet. So how's it going now? And I'm now I'm I'm loving it. I'm loving the laps. I'm doing five laps, uh, Olympic size, and uh, yeah, I'm feeling better. Back in the uh, water, man. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Excellent, sir. Excellent. Ed back in the water doing what he does. Just like Swimming. just like the girl outside the movie theater selling the CDs. <laughs> just like OJ and I returning to the road. Back on the the tour rolls on. On the road again. The disastrous regional tour continues. That's right. This Saturday, a couple of days from now. Very soon. 2.15 p.m. at the New Jersey Comic Anime Con. Morristown Hyatt. Morristown, New Jersey. Going to give you the best we got. That's right. Come for a show. Come to see the show live. It's the show. Bleedly blow. Do, yeah, do, you're, do, gonna do. Have a, you're gonna have you're gonna have a bigger turnout in Morristown. I just know you will. We'll see what happens. <laughs> There's only one way to do the show. Mm-hmm. That's the way we'll do it. No <laughs> matter who's there. That, that little Dracula clip yep. during the show. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So cool. whether there's uh, one person there, two, seven, eight, whatever it is, uh, we always got the people, all you guys on the internet, man, through the computer screen, checking yeah. us out, man. And uh, you know, we know you're here in spirit. And uh, we love you guys, and we'll be doing it for you. you know, that's just what it's all about. So that's it, man. Guys, check out Ed. Follow Ed at Ed underscore Triada on Twitter, of course. See Ed down there all the time talking to people, man. Maybe you want to check out Heroes of the Storm. Send Ed a message. Tell him I used Malfury and I killed all the other characters. My <laughs> name is Jurassic World with the ass capitalized. <laughs> that was my username on Heroes of the Storm. Awesome. You could follow Ed on the Ed Trotta Fan Club on Facebook. Mm-hmm. You can actually go there right now and uh, get a sneak preview of this Dracula video we've been talking about, which we'll be oh, playing man. for the people at the New Jersey Comic Anime Con. But you can go to Ed Trotta's Fan Club on Facebook. Watch the video now. Boom. Check it out. Yes. That's going to yeah. do it, gentlemen. Any final words? Thank you all for tuning in. Watch out for zombies. <laughs> Okay. Uh, live life. It's uh, life is short. <laughs> Have a good time. Have fun. I'm with that on that one. All right. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. This has been a production of StayBallsy.com, the best in free and optional entertainment. Have a pleasant evening, and remember, stay ballsy. Don't take any shit from anyone. <laughs>